going to have to leave here. I'm okay. sorry. That's all right. I think so. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here today. We are grateful for your presence, and we also want to welcome those that are watching by way of Facebook. We're grateful that you are here with us, too. Um, I know we've got at least one announcement, so Bob, if you want to come on. Good morning. I'm Bob James. I'm coming to you today as your chairperson of church council. Um, as you all know, general conference is over. Earlier this month, it concluded and made some decisions uh, that are going to likely impact us here at Woodland. Um, church council over the past year or two has decided to take the stand and wait and see what comes out of general conference before we decide to do take any action that would involve a local church. So now general conference is over. So last week, the church council uh, approved uh, getting a, a concept of getting all of you all involved in what we're going to do next. So a letter is going to go out this week to all membership, all folks on our membership that are, we have on our mailing list. And we're asking for your input. The letter is going to be quite lengthy so it's going to be on its own so when you get it be sure you open it and read it it will provide um, details first of all what came out of general conference particularly about this issue of home of human sexuality uh, pastor robbins already verbalized a lot of that uh, a couple weeks ago but that's all provided in the letter um, what that impact could have on woodland uh, what are the, uh, what is the discernment process? As you know, churches have that opportunity to discern whether we stay in the United Methodist Church or we not stay in the United Methodist Church. So that process is outlined. Um, what our, our, our options are, with that in mind. And then the final question basically is, do you want Woodland to enter into the discernment process? Do you want an opportunity to cast a vote, you know, at a discernment process as to whether we remain in United Methodist Church or take the other option and not remain in United Methodist Church. The letter also has a list of all the council persons' names, phone numbers, emails. And we're going to meet again on Father's Day, June 16th, that evening, for council. What we need from you all is to read through the letter, Make sure you understand all the different points that are in the letter. Come to your own mind as to whether you think you'd like to cast a vote. And then contact one of the council members, whoever your favorite council member is. <laughs> uh, you can talk to them, let them know over the next couple weeks, yes, I want to make, uh, be, have the opportunity to cast a vote, or no, I don't think it's necessary. That's up to you. But contact your council person. You can set them up. Call them on the phone, email, or talk to them in person. Please do it by the 16th. And when we meet together in council, we will then decide, have we heard from everybody, and what is the consensus? And if the consensus is that we go ahead and do this sermon process, we will start that process by contacting the district office and, and getting that ball rolling. Uh, so please take that letter seriously. Look it over. If you have questions, call any of your council members. Call me if you'd like, or Pastor Robin, and um, we'll be glad to answer. But please, we want your input on the whether you want to go ahead and proceed with us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Any other announcements? No? Then what about prayer concerns and praises? What things shall we be in prayer for this week? Sarah Strait. Sarah Strait. Jane and Jim Walters. Debbie Carey Carey. And Laura Nettles. Uh, 
What's that? Bob and Lucy Kate. Bob and Lucy Kate. Xander? Melanie Atkins. Melanie Atkins. Dennis Jones. Dennis Jones. Arista Titus. The Wizen Hunt family. Okay, any others? If not, then I invite you to stand and share signs of Christ's peace with one another. If you would, please turn now in your bulletins to our call to worship and let us read these lines responsibly. Blessed be God, eternal majesty, living word, abiding spirit. Glory to God forever. Amen. Jesus said the way to see God's dream for the world is to be born from above by the spirit. The way to take part in that dream, says Jesus, is to be born of water and the Spirit. That gift is available this day. May you receive God's Spirit, be made whole, and dwell more deeply in love divine. Amen.
may be seated. Please turn now in your bulletin to our morning prayer and let us pray these words together. Holy God, source of all goodness, you gave your son for the life of the world and sent your spirit that your love might abide within us. Teach us how to love each other this day that we may have life and have it abundantly with you in Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let's continue by praying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples and us also to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we have a special Memorial Day prayer, and I'd like to invite you to stand if you're able as we read these words responsively. Let us give thanks to God for the land of our birth with all its chartered liberties, for all the wonder of our country's story. For leaders in nation and state, and for those who in days past and in these present times have labored for the commonwealth. We give you thanks, O God. For those who in all times and places have been true and brave, and in the world's common ways have lived upright lives and ministered to their fellows. We give you thanks, O God. For those who served their country in its hour of need, and especially for those who gave even their lives in that service. We give you thanks, O God. O Almighty God and most merciful Father, as we remember these your servants, remembering with gratitude their courage and strength, we hold before you those who mourn them. Look upon your bereaved servants with your mercy, as this day brings them memories of those they have lost a while. May it also bring your consolation and the assurance that their loved ones are alive now and forever in your loving presence. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks O God, God, in Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This time I would like to invite Bobby Romanek to come forward to talk with us about Salkahatchee. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. Good. So we have Salkahatchee coming up fast. Um, for those, of, I'm sure most of you know what Salkahatchee is, but for those that may not, Salkahatchee is a mission organization. It was started in 1978 um, by Reverend John Cole, um, and he started it as a way to get youth into the mission field because at that time there really wasn't a lot of opportunities for youth to be involved in missions, and he started it as a way for the youth from his church to serve their community in the Hampton area, Hampton County area, very poor area, um, a lot, a very heavily African American area as well that didn't have a lot. And so he wanted to take his youth group and show them how much they have and show them how much they can help their community. Um, and since then, Salkahatchee has grown. Um, we now, this summer we're having 30 camps across the state of South Carolina. Um, and one of them is happening here at the end of June in Rock Hill. Um, and we have 33 people registered as of Friday to come and join us this summer, um, including about 10 youth and four 18-year-olds fresh out of high school. So I still consider them youth. So um, We've got a large group coming. We're planning on working on three homes this summer. Um, in town. Uh, we've got a roof, we've got a lot of flooring and some bathroom work and then some windows and after the storm from last month our work, our scope of work grew significantly. Um, but we're really looking forward to it, we're really excited 
Um, but with the growth in camp and the growth in, um, in work and growth in prices, we are asking that if you feel led, we would love for you to donate. However, we will take your prayers. That is the best thing you can give us are your prayers leading up to the week. Our camp begins June 22nd and will run June 22nd through the 29th. Um, I'd like to go ahead and say a special thank you to the United Women in Faith of Woodland. They sent a donation to our camp, and we appreciate that so much. Um, you have no idea how much it means to receive a donation. We also accept donations of Gatorades and waters and snacks. Um, and if, when we get closer to camp or we get in the week of camp, we may have a list of things that we may need that we can't find at the store or we're running short on money. And if you have a sink laying around, we can use it. Um, you know, that kind of situation. So <laughs> um, please feel free to uh, contact me. You can get my contact information from Alec or Juliet. I think Pastor Robin has my contact information as well. Um, we have a Venmo account. There's a QR code in your bulletin if you would like to donate $5. That's enough for a case of waters if you'd like to donate more. If you'd like to, like I said, pray for our camp. Well, that's the biggest thing I can ask for, and that's what I've been asking everybody for for a year now. And it is working because our camp is growing. Um, and it's getting more youth involved, and it's going to be a great summer. Um, and please, if you have questions, come find me. My name is Bobby. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to tell you about Sockahatchee some more. Um, but thank you so much for all that you do for our camp, all that you did, have done for our camp previously, that you'll do for our camp this summer. We are so looking forward to it. And we love all of you, and we love Rock Hill. So thank you. Amen. Thank you, Bobby. Our hymn of celebration this morning is found in the hymnal on page 103, page 103. If you're able, please stand as we sing. now to the backs of your hymnals to page 881 where you'll find the Apostles Creed let us use these words to profess our faith people of God what do you believe I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. I'll be reading to you from chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Then one of the Sarahs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. Then the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. <clears throat> These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our hymn of preparation is found on page 415 in your hymnal. You may remain seated as we sing. Today, we're going to be talking about callings. Isaiah, the prophet, was minding his own business when God called him out of the blue to be in the role of a prophet. This is how a call works. God breaks into our ordinary lives to call us into extraordinary service. That was how my own calling worked. I was going about my everyday life, working in a job that I loved, when God called me into the ministry. Like Isaiah, I questioned my qualifications for the work to which God was calling me. And like Isaiah, whose lips were purified by a live coal, God equipped me for the work God was calling me to do. This is another way that calls work. God doesn't call the equipped, God equips the called. The same thing happened to Moses when he was called. He was going about his everyday life as a shepherd when God called him from the burning bush to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. Like Isaiah and me, Moses doubted he was equipped for the work God had for him. So God equipped Moses, gave him Aaron as a spokesperson since Moses wasn't well spoken. And God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the call. And God, God has a call for every single one of us here today. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be disciples. This is a very special calling, just as it was for Peter and Andrew when Jesus said, come, follow me. Notice that Jesus didn't call Peter and Andrew to be church members. He called them to be disciples or apprentices who would live a lifestyle like the one Jesus lived. 
You see, it is possible to be a church member without being a disciple. Church members agree to believe that Jesus is their savior and give their loyalty to a particular church. And one can do this without ever becoming a follower in the way of Jesus, without ever responding to the call to be a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus. You realize, of course, that every one of us is a follower of someone or something. We are continually being influenced to follow various people or paths of living. It's impossible to be a human being without being a follower of something. Perhaps we follow in the way of being successful in business, always looking to advance, to make more money, and to be in charge. Or perhaps we follow in the way of social media, wanting to be liked and wanting others to see only the good things in our lives rather than the real ups and downs that everyone experiences. Or perhaps we follow in the way of politics, trying to influence others to take our position on explosive topics or following a particular political figure trying to think the same way that she or he does. One way or another, all of us are following something or someone. It's just part of being human and being alive. As Christians, though, we are called to live the lifestyle that Jesus lived, one of grace and love. And just as, just as God called Isaiah to be a prophet, Jesus calls each one of us to be a disciple. To understand what it meant in Jesus' day to be called as someone's disciple, we need to first understand the Jewish educational system that was in action in Jesus' day. And I'm going to read to you a little bit about that. This comes from the book, Practicing the Way, Be With Jesus, Become Like Him, Do As He Did, by John Mark Comer. So as far as the Jewish educational system worked, Jewish kids started school around five years old at the local Bet Sefer, the house of the book, which was the equivalent of elementary school. Normally, the Bet Sefer was built onto the side of the synagogue and run by a full-time scribe or teacher. The curriculum was the Torah, and in an oral culture, by the age 12 or 13, most kids would have the entire Torah, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, memorized. At that point, the vast majority of students went home. They would apprentice in the family business or help run the farm. But the best and brightest would go on to a second level of education called Bet Midrash, the house of learning, where they would continue their studies. By the age of 17, they would have memorized, and just wait for it, the whole entire Old Testament. Now, at this point, the overwhelming majority of the students were done and were basically told to go make babies, pray that they become rabbis, and ply your trade. But the best of the best of the best would apprentice under a rabbi. Now, this was really hard to get into. Apprenticeship programs were the equivalent of the Ivy League today, but were even more exclusive. You had to find a rabbi whose life you were drawn to and then beg to join his band of students. The rabbi would grill you. How well do you know the Torah? What's your take on the Nephilim and Genesis 6? Do you side with Hillel or Shami on Deuteronomy 24? Tell me, how often do you pray? And if he thought you had the smarts, the work ethic, and the chutzpah to one day become a rabbi yourself, he would say something like, come, follow me. Or another way to translate that is to come apprentice under me. Now let's say you were one of the lucky few who became an apprentice to a rabbi. From that day on, your life was organized around three driving goals. 
The first one was to be with your rabbi. Jesus himself invited his disciples to be with him. You would leave your family, your village, your trade, and follow your rabbi 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You were a student, but class wasn't Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 11 to 11.50. Class was life. You would spend every waking moment with your rabbi, sleeping at his side, eating at his table, sitting at his feet, and end up, after long hours of walking behind him from town to town, covered in his dust, all day, every day. The second goal was to become like your rabbi. <clears throat> Jesus had this great line about how the disciple is not above the rabbi, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their rabbi. That was the heart and soul of apprenticeship, being with your master for the purpose of becoming like your master. You would copy his tone of voice, his mannerisms, his figures of speech. You wanted to be him. Finally, your goal was to do as your rabbi did. The whole point of apprenticeship was to train under a rabbi in order to one day become a rabbi yourself. If you made it through the gauntlet of discipleship, and that was a real if. Then, when he thought you were ready, your rabbi would turn to you and say something like, Okay, kid, I give you my blessing. Go and make disciples. This is what it meant to be a disciple. This is still what it means to be a disciple. So to be called to be a disciple was a huge honor and demanded the whole life and focus of the one being apprenticed to achieve the three goals of discipleship, to be with your rabbi, to become like your rabbi, and to do as your rabbi did. These are still the same goals of discipleship today. I want us to talk about the first goal this morning, being with your rabbi. When Jesus called his disciples, he literally called them to follow in his footsteps, leaving behind family, vocation, and community. But since Jesus is no longer on this earth, we can't follow him this literally. So how can we be with our rabbi? How can we walk closely enough to Jesus that we get covered in the dust from his feet? Well, the Holy Spirit, who is fully available to us today, is the way we get to Jesus. The Spirit makes it possible for us to follow Jesus' command in John 15, which was to abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. When Jesus says, abide in me, he means, make your home with me as I make my home in you. To abide in Jesus is to live and move inside his life by the power of the Holy Spirit. To have Jesus abide in us is to make our body into a temple that Jesus' presence can fill. And when Jesus' presence fills us, and when we abide in his presence, we are with our rabbi following so closely that the dust from his feet covers us. Let me let you in on a secret about abiding. <clears throat> abiding is a skill, and as a skill, it requires practice to become natural. And as a skill, it's not that difficult or arduous to do. As missionary Frank Laubach said, the simple practice requires only a gentle pressure of the will, not more than a person can easily exert. This skill just requires a refocusing of our thoughts. To abide in Jesus and to let Jesus abide in us means sitting still in Jesus' presence, looking at him with love, and seeing him look at us with love. Looking at Jesus, looking at us with love flowing in both directions is the way that we can be with our rabbi. 
And we can practice doing this many times throughout the day until it becomes a habit. As human beings, our brains are automatically generating thoughts. Sometimes we focus our thoughts like when we're trying to solve a problem or working on a new project for work. But most of the, <clears throat> most of the time, our thoughts are all over the place. Abiding in Jesus and letting him abide in us means refocusing our thoughts throughout the day so that we picture ourselves loving Jesus and being loved by him. When we do this often enough, our brains begin to naturally turn in this direction so that eventually our thoughts automatically turn to Jesus. Let's practice this for just a moment. If you're willing, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes for a few moments. Now imagine that, like Jesus' friend Mary, you are sitting at Jesus' feet to learn from him. You're sitting at the feet of your rabbi. Take a moment to look at Jesus. Without speaking any words, Jesus says with his eyes and his smile that he loves you, that he adores you. Bask in his attention for a bit. Feel the love that Jesus has for you. Feel how delighted he is in you. And now listen for anything he might want to tell you about his love. Give him all of your attention. Perhaps he'll use words to tell you how much he loves you, or perhaps a smile and his face will say it all. As you sit soaking up his love, begin to notice the feelings of love for Jesus that are beginning to bubble up inside you in response to his love for you. Think about how happy you are to be loved this deeply and begin to reflect that love back to Jesus. Imagine that your eyes and your smile say to Jesus that you love him. Through your facial expression, imagine you are showing Jesus your devotion to him. And feel free to imagine yourself saying to Jesus whatever is in your heart right now. Once you've expressed yourself, give Jesus your full attention again as you listen for anything that he has to say to you or any images he wants to show you. Finally, as you get ready to come back to this place, thank Jesus for his love and tell him that you'll be back for another time of devotion soon. And as soon as you're ready to do so, you may begin to open your eyes. One of the ways to describe this process that we just used to love Jesus and to see him loving us is contemplative prayer. You and Jesus have, have contemplated one another and both have found love. By often engaging in this practice, you are abiding in Jesus and allowing him to abide in you. In other words, you are getting as close to your rabbi as you can get, close enough that the dust from his feet covers your feet. This is what we mean when we say the first goal of discipleship is to be with Jesus. You know, Jesus himself told us that the most important commandments are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. But as human beings, the way we learn to love is by experiencing being loved ourselves. Sitting in Jesus' presence, absorbing his love, feeling ourselves unconditionally accepted is the way we learn to love God and to love others. Only as we experience God's unconditional love can we show that love to others. So to recap, like Isaiah, we are each called by God. Isaiah was called to be a prophet. We are called to be disciples, not church members. 
And like Isaiah, when God calls us, God equips us for the task at hand. God equips the called. And remember what a special gift it is to be called by a rabbi to be a disciple. In Jesus' day, only the best of the best of the best were called to follow a rabbi. The difference with Jesus is that he calls all of us, the fisherman and the tax collector, the trader, the Samaritan woman at the well, the man born blind, Mary Magdalene, and even the rich young ruler. Jesus is calling you to be a disciple too. Jesus is saying to each of us that he needs disciples to show his love to the world. When he asks us, as God asked Isaiah, whom shall I send? May we all say, here am I, send me. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of reflection is found on page 338 in your hymnal. Page 338, you may remain seated.
Would the ushers please come forward? Almighty God, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings that you've already given us. And now we welcome this opportunity to return to you your tithes and our offerings. We ask that you would accept these gifts, bless them, multiply them, and use them throughout the world where they'll do the most good for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on page 593 in your hymnals, page 593.
now may we all go in the peace and in the power of the Holy Spirit with great rejoicing out into the world to love everybody we meet as though we were meeting Jesus himself. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.